there are two kinds of studies that you can consider. One of them are observational, and Strong Hearts, a longitudinal cohort study, which is probably the most complex kind of observational study. And then there are experimental studies, uh, mainly clinical trials, and that's the other uh, offshoot of Strong Heart I'm going to tell you about. And there are advantages to both. And you need to consider that as you have the discussions this afternoon. Um, the uh, observational study gives you a lot of information on temporal sequences, multiple effects, um, multiple exposures. You can uh, it have multiple disease endpoints, very long follow-ups. But the limitations is um, the uh, loss to follow-up, uh, the fact that there is confounding, and it's not efficient for rare diseases. And it's expensive, although I would urge you, I was glad Bert asked that question about electronic medical records, and that I really think that's the future for research all over. Uh, uh, and, and as soon as you can do that Cerner system, uh, it'll be extremely valuable. Uh, now, the advantages of the controlled trial is you have co comparable groups. You can actually uh, conclude cause and effect. You have a randomization. And you can do subgroup analyses. But uh, on the other hand, the limitations where's the lim is uh, they're not always generalizable. Uh, recruitment and retention is more difficult. And um, there's uh, more work to do to get people to accept it. But I'll show you that it's definitely doable. And they tend to be more expensive. So Strong Heart started in 1988. With, and we have two cohorts of American Indians from the Dakotas, Oklahoma, and Arizona, a total of 4,500 uh, adults and then another uh, total of 3,800 family members. And our objectives were to study cardiovascular disease. The only reason we were funded is because NHLBI had uh, funded, as you know, Framingham, and there was Cardia and Eric, and three or four uh, very big, very well-funded, uh, expensive studies that were examining first only white men, but then they expanded to women and to blacks and to Hispanics. But there was nothing in American Indians, and there was an advisory board to the, the then director of NHLBI who said they had to do something in Indians. Now, they were sure it couldn't be done, so they gave us a small amount of money, and from that <laughs> small amount of money, we had the highest recruitment rate of any of their studies because the, that first cohort is a population-based sample, and we've had the highest retention rates. So uh, that it, we, we had, uh, as we went on, uh, they that was recognized that, well, maybe Strongheart would succeed. Um, and one of the reasons we succeeded was we started at the very beginning working with the communities. And this was unheard of at the time. But uh, we, uh, they approved our study and methods. Participants were referred for medical care. Uh, we gave the data back for community health initiatives. We participated in them. And we tried to focus on education of community youth. When we started, there were only 25 American Indian physicians in the whole country, and probably less PhDs. But um, we, we, had, we helped, uh, oh, our data was used by over 40 uh, Native PhDs and MDs as they were getting their degrees. And we, now, and we have tried to slowly, we started as all investigators that look like me, but we tried to bring in as many Native investigators. At this point, we have uh, more than 40. Um, all, all our staff has always been Native. We have it now one PI for the Strong Heart Study, one co-PI, and eight uh, Native investigators on our steering committee. So uh, my goal, I've always said, is for it, the, it to be totally run by Native investigators. And I think we'll be there uh, you know, in, in your lifetime, maybe not in mine. Um, so anyway, here are our methods, and you are welcome to them. It's important when you do any kind of observational study to use standardized methods, because uh, you want the data to be uh, useful and, and believable. And also, the, you, you're going to want to make comparisons, especially since now you're in two separate 
uh, communities. You are welcome to all of these. These, are, well, these were taken, many of them, from the other standard epi studies, so they had been tested and approved. And um, then for, the, uh, for a longitudinal study, as you know, you do measurements of people and then you follow them to see what kind of disease they have. So we did yearly contact and medical record review. Uh, my husband, early on, because I'm not a physician, became the expert in, uh, in learning how to do systematics, uh, adjudica review and adjudication of endpoints. And there are now standard procedures published by NHLBI and, and uh, the uh, National Institutes of Health, and they are, we have followed them uh, quite rigorously, and he is very happy to come up and teach, as he did in Alaska, teach the um, physicians in the study how to do these reviews and, and get you started so that you, when you, in addition to using, collecting data with standard methods, that you get outcomes uh, that are done, but that are defined the same way. So if you want to compare your rate of MI or cancer to other studies, you'll be able to. Um, so uh, the other thing I didn't tell you is the one little glimmer of interest in NHLBI at the time they funded was, us was this idea in the middle of the 20th century that American Indians were protected from heart disease. And uh, so we were supposed to figure out why. And if, if soon after we started, probably the, in, it was in at least five years, uh, our data showed exactly the opposite. Now this slide shows um, atherosclerotic plaque. We were able to do ultrasound measures of the carotid artery for ultrasound plaque. It's non-invasive and the plaque rep it's representative of the plaque that's in the coronary vessels. And here, this light blue is strong heart. And here's the yellow, same method in ERIC and CHS. Those were two of the big NHLBI studies. And we had a higher amount of plaque in all our age groups. And then, finally, we got enough data to have CHD incidence. And lo and behold, and we, again, since we used standardized methods, we could compare it to the ERIC study of whites and blacks and in strong heart women and men, we had a higher incidence of CHD. And uh, we also have higher incidence rates of stroke and of heart failure. Uh, pardon me for going quickly through these numerical slides, but I know you want lunch, and if you have questions, you can ask me. But uh, I, I'm trying to give you the main message, and every aspect of cardiovascular disease that we've looked at has been higher, and this is, of course, of great concern. And um, uh, so immediately we wanted to ask why, what was causing this, and the obvious thing uh, to look at, of course, is diabetes. We had high prevalence rates of diabetes. This is the blue are diabetes, and the white are impaired glucose tolerance. We had done GTTs on these people the first time around. We don't do it anymore. But anyway, you can see in Arizona around 50 percent and around 40 percent in the other two areas of diabetes. And almost all of the events were occurring in people with diabetes. This is if you are in impaired, with impaired fasting glucose, because in this population, you very quickly convert from impaired fasting glucose to diabetes. And so, um, the CHD, the stroke, the heart failure rates, if you add up these percentages, just for example, 80% uh, of all of the CHD cases in women were in women with diabetes or IFG. And uh, strokes, 79%. Uh, it's slightly lower percentages in the men. So um, here's, here's what we think happened, and it's a lesson that um, we, is, is uh, important for the whole world, and it's been recognized uh, in, in many other countries, and it's happening now in many other underdeveloped countries. If, if you have a population with a high susceptibility to diabetes, you start out and you start getting an increase in the amount of diabetes over, usually it takes 25 or 30 years for the rates to build up. 
Now, it, a complication like heart disease or cardiovascular disease probably takes 20, 15 to 20 years to manifest itself after a person gets the diabetes. So if you then plot the amount of people who've had diabetes for 15 or 20 years, it takes longer for that to build up. And then once that happens, then you start increasing your rate of the complication like heart disease. So it's very true that in the first half of the 20th century when the American Indians were beginning to develop this epidemic of diabetes, you didn't see much cardiovascular disease. But once this epidemic established itself and people had it a long time, then the cardiovascular disease really exploded. And that's so we think this is Peter Bennett's um, uh, algorithm, but I think it's very applicable. And I've done some work in China, and China's over here somewhere where the epidemic of diabetes is building, but they haven't had it long enough to really get hit with the cardiovascular disease that they're going to get. So um, this, now this, uh, uh, is, uh, the other thing we try to look at is risk factors that could be treated and one of the people thought, that, oh, there's no heart disease in Indians because the, their LDL levels are low, and they are. But when you plot LDL levels against risk for cardiovascular disease, you see this very steep curve, much steeper than you see in other populations. And the same thing with blood pressure. Blood pressure is not very high, even in diabetic uh, Indians in our hands, uh, compared to what we see in the African-American community, say. Um, in some of our other populations. But again, it has a very strong effect. Even prehypertension uh, uh, influences survival, and uh, this is just survival curves in people with normal prehypertension and hypertension in strong heart. And the same thing with uh, uh, the L strong heart, well, back to that. And then the other thing we found that was a very important risk factor that hadn't been recognized was renal disease, which we measured first by albuminuria, but now more often e uh, GFRs are, are measured in the clinical setting. And again, people with just mild albuminuria had lower survival, and those with macroalbuminuria had, were severely affected uh, with CVD. So, so what we found is there was this uh, unique aspects of cardiovascular risk with steeper slope for LDL cholesterol compared to the Framingham equation, steeper slope for hypertension, and that you needed to consider renal function. So we developed a, predictive equ a prediction equation that's published on the web, and the Indian Health Service adopted it. And on the basis of our work, um, a whole prevention program, Jim Galloway was head of, of cardiology for IHS at the time. They set up a whole prevention program across IHS. It focused more on diabetic patients to control LDL levels, to control blood pressure, and to uh, pay attention to the renal disease uh, to identify the people at greatest risks. And other populations have used this risk score. Now this, um, uh, this was for CHD risk, because that's what Framingham predicts. But now that ATP4 came up with an ASCVD, which is combination heart disease and stroke, we're redoing the equation to allow clinicians to use uh, a, 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 an equation for ASCVD. So um, I, I hope that I went fast, but I hope that shows you that uh, you can get information that really has a, uh, an impact on the communities because it, it, we know uh, that it resulted in uh, more aggressive treatment, uh, and prevention especially, uh, and the IHS clinics, at least in our areas, uh, really befo before that hadn't really been caring about cholesterol and not so much even about blood pressure. Uh, and so, uh, but then it w became very relevant for the rest of the country because up until, uh, no, up until this point, I was member of, uh, very active in both ADA and AHA, and the ADA put all its energy on retinopathy and on nephropathy and, and neuropathy, 
never mentioned CBD, and the American Heart Association had no committees on diabetes as a risk factor. And so, uh, but things changed uh, from this and then other work by other people that followed. And so it had a big impact on, um, on uh, medical care throughout the country. So I don't mean to be egotistical about this, just to, pr to prove that um, this sort of attitude that reviewers in journals have and reviewers on study sections have that, oh, you're just studying a tribe of Indians. Um, but then the, is, is, is just so unfair because what you learn in a, any population not, doesn't just have relevance to that population. It has a, a, a applicability to others, either in this country or other places around the world. So I thought since this is a uh, focus on obesity, I'd show you uh, we haven't done a lot with the obesity. Uh, but it, it, I can show you we have extremely high rates of obesity in the women and the men. The women are slightly higher. This is by age group from fi our 15 to 18 year olds, 32% of the young women and 31% of the men are obese. And it, so it starts very early because it doesn't even get that much higher. Um, then this just shows again uh, overweight. That was, this was BMI. Sorry, this was BMI levels. I apologize, I'm trying to go too fast. But anyway, these are the BMI levels in um, the men and women of the various age groups, highest in the women uh, high as, than the men, but very high even at a young age. And then here's the rates of obesity. And so you can see by uh, the rates of obesity, just forgetting about overweight, in, again, by, by these age groups, uh, you can see 49% of the 15 to 18 year old young men are obese and 62% of the young women. And it quickly goes up into the 70s for a women and or in, for men and close to 80% obese in the, in the women. Now this higher age group is, is um, lower and that's probably both a survival effect and also a cohort effect that the obesity rates have increased in time and these people were born in a different generation. Um, so of course, one of the things that's obvious and you all know, but it was very obvious that the incidence of diabetes is greatly affected by, by obesity. So the rate, the, the risk of becoming diabetic is much, much higher in our obese uh, men and women than in our normal weight men and women. And, uh, but the other thing we found that isn't so commonly known, we were able to not just do ultrasound uh, measures of the carotids, we did them of the heart, we did echo cardiograms. And we were able to measure cardiac function and structure. It's non-invasive, it doesn't hurt, people kind of like laying there and watching their heart beating. So it was well received. And uh, we found disturbing changes in all of the measures of cardiac uh, function and structure as you took 14 and 20 year olds and compared the normal overweight and obese ones. And by the ones who were obese already had L uh, LVH, uh, enlarged, enlarged heart, and then uh, inadequacies of cardiac output. And, um, I, I'm in terms of talking to people about uh, studies that might be very valuable in younger obese uh, people is to try to see if any kind of a treatment, uh, perhaps more aggressive blood pressure lowering or, or and other stra clinical strategies might be able to reverse these changes because these changes are harbingers of events. And as these kids get these changes lower earlier, in, in life, they're going to get their events lower so, earlier in life. Um, then the only, I'll tell you just for um, um, lifestyle, uh, we've done more there. Mandy Fretz, one of our American Indian PhDs, looked at uh, physical activity. No surprise, we have half our people with less than 5,000 steps per day and very few who are active. 
And then the AHA put out this Life Simple 7 Dietary Guidelines for Fruits and Vegetables and Fish. You, those of you who are into nutrition know about these. And the NHANES data of Americans, we don't do so well as a whole. But our uh, data from Strongheart, we had almost nobody eating the, the amount of fruits and vegetables, fish, or whole grains. Um, we, of course, had a lot of sweetened beverages and uh, saturated fat and processed meats. One of the worst things she found was the strongest pre dietary predictor of diabetes in our hands is spam. And uh, of all the I food items, uh, processed meat as a whole is, uh, but the spam was just stood out like a light, I'm sorry to say. Uh, okay, so what happened it was uh, we had this information. We wanted to do some intervention to improve uh, things if we could. And we managed to actually get funded for a randomized blinded trial. We had learned that we had this epidemic of CVD, that LDL and bl blood pressure were strong predictors, and that the carotid and echo measures could be used as a predictor of CVD events. So we could, in other words, use uh, not hard endpoints, but uh, indirect endpoints of cardiovascular disease because they made it clear they would not give us enough money for a trial to go long enough to do hard endpoints. So um, at that time, there was a whole big bunch of debate about treating to lower targets for both LDL and blood pressure. Those of you who are clinicians will remember this. This was over 10 years ago. So we designed SANS. We ran it in the three, heart, the three strong heart studies centers, plus in Navajo. Uh, it's the only time we, were, we, we did involve Navajo. And uh, our hypothesis was if we lower, we randomized people to two groups and the intervention group, we would treat the cholesterol to 70, the non-HDL cholesterol to 100, and the systolic blood pressure to 115, that we'd see an improvement. And so this is the study design. This is your classic clinical trial where you take people. We wanted 40 years of old, of age or older, with no CVD, but with people who had blood pressure above 130 and an LDL above 100, needed to be higher than the targets to begin with. And we randomized them. And then we measured the uh, CVD using the carotid and cardiac echoes at 18 months and after three years. And our primary, we have to have a primary outcome. It was the change in the carotid intimal medial thickness. And um, so again, we have all these protocols and clinical trials can be done in American Indian communities just as well, you following the same things, working with the community have, you know, having all the staff be uh, Amer American Indian from the community and trained. And so we, uh, and we performed this with mid-level practitioners there. So we had a nurse or nurse practitioner in all the field centers. Our, our physicians who designed, my husband was the one who designed the, the, the LDL management and we had a, a blood pressure expert for blood pressure. They had their pagers, they were available for call, but this was basically accomplished by the staff in each center and mostly all of them were uh, American Indian. So the patients were randomized, followed every three months, all the personnel were blinded except for the physician and the nurse who were measuring their blood pressure and lipids. The, uh, uh, we used standardized protocols. And the other thing we did is because when you're trying to treat L blood pressure, you know it's easy. The patient comes in, you measure their blood pressure, you can decide if you want to adjust the medication. For, uh, for lipids, you have to take blood, you send it out, you wait till it comes back, then you have to try to get the patient back. Well, we used the point of care finger stick. LDL, which was new at the time, they're more common now. So again, we could tell when they had the one visit every three months, we could tell what their LDL was and adjust their medications. And these are our primary and secondary endpoints. And here's the baseline characteristics, only to show you they were typical of our strong heart data uh, with a high BMI, but not particularly high blood pressure in LDL. 
uh, we don't have a, uh, too high a smoking rate in Strongheart, uh, but you know, obviously, um, uh, high. Uh, the point I'm trying to tell you here is that when you randomize, there's virtually no differences between your groups. The only thing that was significantly different was the standard group had a little lower blood pressure to start with than the aggressive. And that's because we only had uh, 300 some odd patients. You have, if you had 1,000, you wouldn't even see that. Um, and so this is to show you this can be successfully done in the communities by uh, local, local mid-level uh, practitioners and staff. And so here's the LDL cholesterol uh, at randomization. Oh, it was over 100 in both groups. Here's the aggressive group. It came down to 70 almost in the first few months and stayed that way. Whereas in the um, standard group, of course, the white coat effect, we got some decrease. And, um, it, uh, and they were being treated to, to 100 and it stayed that way. So that's the kind of things you can accomplish. Uh, and and it, don't let anyone tell you it can't be done. Same thing with blood pressure. Uh, they started at 130. The aggressive group got down to 110 and stayed there. And the standard group stayed around 130 for the duration of the trial. And uh, this just shows you uh, in graphic form, we got in the, in the aggressive group, the light bars, changes in LDL, total cholesterol, n nothing much with HDL, but the triglycerides came down too, and the non-HDL cholesterol came down. We had a lipid al a treatment algorithm that did also address the triglycerides if they were elevated after the LDL was controlled. Um, changes in blood pressure, same thing. And um, we had almost no adverse events. And this was important because none of these drugs had been tested in American Indians. Um, there's almost never any American Indians in the drug trials. And we had, luckily, very little adverse effects from the standard algorithms. I don't have time to go through them with you, but I can show you what drugs were used. It was the things you would be very familiar with. And here's our IMT data. You can see that the uh, it, this is uh, the left side is everybody. Even if they stopped coming after the first visit, we had good retention. But at the end, we measured everybody. You can see IMT went up. The carotid plaque went up in the control group. It went down in the intervention group. And there was a big difference between the two, a significant difference. Sensitivity analysis meant we analyzed the data without the people who didn't show all along till the last visit. And we know they weren't taking their meds. So of course you get a bigger drop in the uh, IMT in them. Um, and this is, and this just shows you that if, if you took uh, other strong heart participants over the three and four year period, their IMT went up. The other thing that got better was their LV mass, their cardiac hypertrophy got lower in the intervention group. This is the intention to treat analysis. This is the sensitivity analysis. And then we looked at what happened. There were no, no interactions, but we aren't powered. It didn't seem to matter with the age, BMI, sex, baseline values. Um, and then when you <coughs> tried to figure out what was causing what, statistically, it, the LDL uh, looked like it was, oops, sorry. The LDL looked like it was causing the uh, change in carotids, and the uh, blood pressure looked like it might be causing the change in the, the imp blood pressure improvement, the change in the cardiac size. So the summary is that the standard targets can, and aggressive targets can be safely reached, uh, that we got improvement in the s surrogate endpoints, and um, in both the, the atherosclerosis and cardiac function. And we're just waiting. They wouldn't refund us. We didn't have enough power for hard endpoints. We have to wait another 10 years or so to accumulate enough hard endpoints. So uh, my conclusion for this talk is that uh, diabetes greatly increases the risk for cardiovascular disease, um, that the, we have important risk factors that can be managed to improve cardiovascular disease, 
the obesity rates are high and strong predictors of diabetes as well as cardiac function. Um, activity levels and nutrition interventions are feasible approaches, and we are doing some of them. And um, coupling a clinical trial with a population study really eases, uh, helps the design and the interpretation. And so we have this huge number of people. I talk and they do all the work. And I, these are extra slides. Thank you very much for your attention.